This meeting is being recorded by host or participant. I first got it. Okay, so it's not uh, working. You're not recording. So you'll. Uh, I'll, I, can, I'll, I can download it from, from your. I can download it from your channel. I know. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> we will begin in uh, five, four, three, two, one. This is Abraham Weisfeld, Dr. Abraham Weisfeld, actually, speaking to you on behalf of my position as uh, chairman of the United International Intercommunalist Convergence, uh, which includes the work of Comrade Net here, who is the uh, spokesperson for the Jewish Antifa Bundes Vanguard of the People's Social Freedom Movement in Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona in particular. Now, there's a number of items which um, uh, it is necessary for us to hear from Comrade Net about the uh, movement that is founded by a political philosophy which was founded uh, itself by, among others, Frederick Benson and uh, became known as uh, Demarchism. Uh, Demarchism, you know, is rooted in uh, the same thing as uh, what democracy is rooted in, in terms of the Latin word demos, which means people. Or the masses. So democracy means the rule of the masses, the rule of the people. Demarchism is the authority of the people, not just the rule. It goes beyond just the rule of the people, but to become uh, the authority in place of the state, which is the essence of liberalism. So that's the difference between demarchism and uh, democracy. Basically, its difference is, you know, liberalism and liberalism is basically the um, atomization of the individual as a citizen within the state and ultimately within the nation state itself unless you are excluded because you're not of the primary nation quote unquote so you know we have a, a demarcus theory you know based in uh, political philosophy in a historical context but uh, what is it now and what is it uh, functioning as a, after it has been founded by the, uh, the gang of five uh, or so. Um, Comrade Nat, uh, what is uh, the Dimash? And how does it uh, differ from, let's say, the Anarch? Uh, how is the Demarch different from the Anarch? Well, okay, first of all, I should get the Anarch out of the way. The Anarch uh, could be, like, it depends on which anarchist theorist you're going by, because some would say that the anarchist is an individual who basically leads a unit of uh, anarchists or a squad of anarchists for a certain thing. But but in the commune of anarchy theory, Denmark is transition from state to non-state. That's a, it's the transition period between the two, um, where we're basically philosophical vanguard people from the proletariat, from whatever is proletarian basically makes this transition happen. Um, it's It's... I don't quite agree with that thing. Um, whereas the Demarch, completely different, not even remotely related, despite the similarity in the word. Demarch refers to the five um, individuals who um, uh, put direct democracy at the forefront of the theory, which kind of diverged away from communism because communism would basically means like uh, secularism having to be part of it regardless. That's kind of what communism means in Demarcus theory, whereas Demarcus theory is more about, okay, to transcend those norms, like where if everybody was truly equal to each other, like, why do you, like, who, who, secular, who comes up with the secular norm? Who makes this norm? Like, we're, like, and if you really dig into that, it's from Western Christianity, it's post-Western Christian authority, basically. So the Demarch is the collective that uh, developed the theory, the political theory, that uh, is now formulated as uh, demarchism. But the demarches, uh, I have their names here that you gave me the, in your writings. Uh, Frederick Danson, Herbert Dillon, Shabazz Dinjamal, Marcus Dinjamal, and uh, 
the uh, metaphoric name, the collective of Azam Abdul Hakim, right? Yeah. So uh, perhaps you could give us a, you know, a bit of a breakdown in each of these people. Well, I'm not an expert actually in the Dijamal brothers, although I do understand their function in the Denmark, like what they're writing in particular. Actually, in a lot of ways, they were the most important, I think, because that's what led to the Azam theory. Hmm. Um, but um, Frederick Danson um, was somebody that actually taught me. So uh, I, among... Um, who's going to be known publicly as Comrade Sai. There is video footage of him. Actually, it just hasn't been published yet. Um, but uh, Comrade Sai, myself, and I mean, from what I understand, Comrade Sai has already apparently said this in the, the, his recording, so I just might as well say Donna Newman. We were actually the three students, the three, uh, there were many students of Frederick Danson, but there were three prodigies he had in there when he came to Arizona. That was me, Donna Newman, and Comrade Sai. Um, and Fred was um, basically um, post-Soviet minded, um, uh, divested away from social democracy, um, basically studied Leninism, agreed with a lot of the praxis about what was being shown and how it was proven, but ultimately said, ultimately said, yeah, still Hungarian, even he's not like free from it. And, you know, um, I would also say that that's also why I had a poor understanding of Mao's. He wasn't very into Mao. He didn't understand Mao very well. Mm -hmm. um, but he based stuff on what he thought was appropriate for true freedom and or like for a free society where everybody's still equal. And uh, that's why he was into the Green Book. Jeha Maria mm -hmm. uh, was, was, he said, that's that's what he says. He wish he, wish he said socialism should become Jeha Maria, not... Um, communism although he wouldn't write it that way because it would sound weird it wouldn't sound you know like a floated world if he said that so he uh pointed out direct democracy because that's let's you face it that's really what the green book is trying to promote is direct democracy mm -hmm. yes yes and uh the critique of the uh you know a bourgeois liberal electoral party system as well is part of the green theory part of the gemaria in which uh, political parties are not you know allowed to sort of uh, infiltrate themselves into the uh, civil society based upon the uh, resources that they have in terms of, you know, foreign cash and all that sort of thing. So instead, you know, there was the Revolutionary Committee movement, you know, which I was part of, I was the organizer for North America. And we would have um, various revolutionary committees, you know, organized around different issues and different responsibilities and each autonomous from each other and, and autonomous in their political views as well. And they could make criticisms of, uh, the consensual sort of opinion that uh, may have been developed and was supposed to be corrected by the revolutionary communities itself. But I never really had time to become very operative. You know, we were just in the formative stages and uh, the international coordinator, you know, uh, Jamal, he was, uh, he died, you know, he may have been actually assassinated in a, in a fake road, road accident or something. And we lost him and then we lost the international coordination and I was left alone. And then, you know, the uh, counter-revolutionary uh, events took place, uh, which uh, have not ended yet. And we'll see yet uh, what the outcome is to be. So um, it is the essence of uh, the Jamaria, you know, the direct democracy, you know, that it was developed into a political philosophy, I understand here. Now, the um, uh, subsequent, uh, you know, what developed, you know, since that time, is sort of a convergence towards that uh, perspective as if it were a focus, you know? And uh, the uh, one such co major component is Peace Bill's uh, social freedom movement. I wonder if you can explain, you know, what, how that works and uh, its various, uh, and some of its components, you know, like, uh, like the uh, unit uh, that you represent, the Jewish Antifa Buddhist Vanguard. How does this, uh, how is this reflected in terms of, you know, political convergence uh, and, um, and what developments, you know, can we look forward to? Well, okay, so um, we can't use the communist way because the communist way will always say stay away from reactionaries and we can't use the fascist way because the fascists uh, not only recruit reactionaries deliberately, but they make non-reactionaries into reactionaries. So the idea is just to take it at face value and like 
if we were going to really change things, we'd have to really drop a lot of philosophies. You'd have to be, you know, and, and what scares people about that is that's going to lead to the truly de depressed and the truly depressed are always superstitious, but why? I see like, that's a word which is nebulous itself. So I think what I mean by that is I think people who are paranoid, spiritually paranoid, like I don't believe in spirituality. I want to make that clear. I believe in religiosity. I believe in magic. I believe in mysticism. I don't exactly believe in science. I acknowledge the data in science, but science is a different philosophy, if that makes sense. Um, I can agree with science, though, because it's, it's factual, so that's not a problem. You know, anybody who's really into magic doesn't exactly disagree with science. It's more that they disagree with it on a philosophical basis. But like all data, material, empirical, um, philosophical, it, it's all coming undone because those who the institutions that the liberal institutions that spread it you know through libraries and stuff they did they already did their job largely with that now is the point where they would have said that we would be practicing uh, a free egalitarian society if you think about the end of history and what the 90s promised what took away the 90s was 9 11 if you think about it and, and this is the problem i think with america have been for the longest time being on top of everything is that it created a world of such freedom where people were too privileged from themselves. Like it's separate from other uh, first world countries. And democracy is, an, is against basically republic. It's time to admit that the republic is what America is. Canada is a, a parliament thing. I'm not sure how you describe Canada. It's all coming undone. And never again it has a new message. I think that that's, what's, I think that that's been shown out here. Because so there is... People's Social Freedom Movement advocates direct democracy in the United States of America, yes. actually. Okay. Yes. How, yes. How do you, uh, how are you organized yourselves? You know, like you have uh, uh, autonomous units. So like is Buddhism uh, accepted as a political orientation, as a political philosophy? A necessity, actually. That goes back to the to, to, to the original people that uh, wrote it for, for the, under the name of Zam. That's how far that back that goes. Um, from the beginning, it, Buddhism was supposed to be considered essential because it was clear that in the American culture, there's a there's a there's a Christian post Christian problem hangover, and a lot of it ties into Zionism. There's a reason for that. So instead of being paranoid about Zionism, ask get into the reason, and the reason is well, settler colonialism in Europe is kind of Western Christian, and this is not good for Jewish people. And it's so funny, like Zionism is becoming more and more openly anti Jewish. That's one of the things I kept trying to explain to people. Mm. Um, you, and now you are seeing that a little bit more. And yet, as that's happening, you have like um, anti ultra orthodox stuff coming on uh, Vice, you know, the, the YouTube, you know, Vice TV, like the Vice. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, Netflix is doing it all like, like they're going directly after the ultra orthodox for reason. And that's because it shows that. The secular world may just be very arrogant. They like it, it's not to say that there aren't degenerate things that happen in these groups sometimes, but there. But you can make, but that's kind of rejection too, because like it's way worse. I'm sorry, in the white Christian world. Okay, so the People's Social Freedom Movement and the uh, the Bundes, the Jewish Bund, uh, uh, are opposed to what uh, I think we uh, would recognize as Americanism. Yeah, and, and that's based in what you were saying, you know, as being a Christian nation state, yeah. some sort of a model that people are supposed to assimilate into, which does not respect the uh, the uh, identities of various social formations, national minorities, the indigenous, you know, First Nations, etc. All are sort of, you know, supposed to disappear. They're not supposed to exist, you know, under this. Yeah, model. yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah, it's scary, but and this is where like national cultural autonomy. There is a desperate need like if you if you go online they speak about Buddhism always as much as they can in the past tense now they're sort of admitting that it's having an influence it's like okay well you're trying to avoid national cultural autonomy is what you're doing <laughs> that's right that's what you're doing yeah 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 because they sort of accept the liberal nation state even though they call themselves you know revolutionary socialists or whatever you know or communists they still accept the, you know the bourgeois nation state yeah so what's the point, you know, like of anything else, you know, if you're still going to be controlled by the same apparatus and just different people, yeah, <laughs> we, we they're going to be there in those positions. <laughs> yeah, we, we could have a world transcendental uh, answer where you have basically interfaith respect 
which wouldn't negate atheists. It, it, mm. There is a question of it negating atheism because of the ism, but the ist is fine because atheist means you don't believe in, it's more than I don't believe in God. Atheist means I don't believe in miracles and stuff and supernatural, and that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But the ism, that's part of the secularism trick right there. Yeah. It's the same with agnosticism. Like I've always noticed you've never practiced agnosticism. You are agnostic. You're very agnostic, but you practice Judaism in yeah. a cultural dimension. Yeah. I've seen it. Like yeah. as long as so I can remember talking about it. We have to preserve, we have to pre preserve tradition because it is, you know, the essence of human intelligence. And yeah. culture is is the expression of human intelligence, you know, of various kinds. And there are various humans, you know, the humans do not come in one mold. <laughs> And, uh, you know, what we have to say is that, you know, we need to have a, an inclusive uh, secularism in which there was no one, you know, faith or denomination, you know, which denominates uh, the others, you know, and is in war, you know, with all the others, you know, no, a war of each amongst the, uh, the other, you know, in perpetuity, you know, that's not what, you know, a kind of a secularism that, that we need we need an inclusive you know secularism in which you know not one religion you know becomes a state religion because there's no more state you know the state um, unfortunately for me and, and i think this is the thing i would like to explain to a lot of people who follow dr weisfeld and who follow donna newman or who followed me is i think that the confusion arises that you know i was always with the boon but i i i still have a, a respect for social theocratic you know positions like what you see internally within iran which unfortunately does bleed into the government, and you can you can get, people can get into that. I have a video posted that from a night, woman in, in Iran that was interviewed by the Gray Zone. Mm -hmm. um, but like this is the same thing with the Haredim in New York City that I really wish people would back off and not and stop trying to make up you know nonsense about. I mean, yeah, to me a lot of those positions are 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 are, are weird. I'm like I'm not into like you know um, a lot of what the Hasidic movement is, but like. I know it better than most people. I wish they would shut up. It's the same thing with, Ru I'm scared of Russia phobia. I know more about what's going on with Russians than most people do. And yeah, it's complicated. And yeah, there can be issues. And no one says you have to trust Putin. The guy's a gangster. But like, let's be real. Like who's been aggressing? Who was really stirring the pot before Russia said fine and before China started getting more aggressive with the, with, it was America. America started this. Like the current situation is very, the war on terror was a disaster for for diplomacy. Yeah, I found it very interesting that Russia and Putin are now supporting national self determination of the Donetsk and Lugansk people's autonomous republics with the word autonomy in there. You know, they were trying to set up a federation within Ukraine, and they had an autonomous uh, republic there. But, Russia speaks a very democratic language. But uh, you know, it's not like Russia. Russia is a federation, you know, in which they become, you know, an autonomous region within the federation. Russia is trying to do a nation state thing, just like you know, Israel is trying to do a nation state mm -hmm. thing. You know, Ukraine is very much, you know, like a Zionist entity. In fact, yeah. you know, they're getting uh, support directly from the uh, Israel government now, in spite of the various Russians, you know, living in Russia, you know, who left Russia, you know, because of uh, because of lack of, you know, uh, their uh, religious freedom or not religious freedom, but the lack of a recognition of their national identity. Yeah, and it's weird because in Russia, there's a whole sense that there's these different nations. It's already known. They talk about it openly in the newspapers half the time, but yeah. it's never really done anything about because, well, we lost the Soviets, you know, we just, you know, and it's funny, you know, what allowed them to lose the Soviets is the Soviets, they let go, of, they, they took more and more power away from the Soviets, especially after Stalin, especially after Stalin, because, you know, Stalin at least tried to keep the Soviets intact, but, you know. Well, they were, all the Bolsheviks were in favor of the Soviets until about 1926, even Trotsky agreed, you know, with the extinction of the Soviets. That's what the communists keep forgetting is, yes, it's true, like, you can look through Lenin and Stalin, the Soviets were intact, but not the way you think they are. Like, a lot of the real authority of the Soviets was taken by Lenin, actually. Yeah, I mean, you know, the Communist Party appointed commissars, you know, in each, you know, factory, and they became the Soviet. <laughs> My father was put in jail, you know, by such a commissar, you know, acting on behalf of the Communist Party, you know, because he had missed a day of work. Anyway. <laughs> sorry, so I was sorry. Part of the thing is, is like, yeah, like, I do, I specialize in Bundist Bolshevik um, reconciliation a lot of times, which I think is going to be essential because I, the goal of the Jewish Bundist diaspora movement was to make sure that the Bundist movement, remember that we're putting the Jewish uh, 
international boon in Russia. It has to be at the Oblast, basically. It, I, I'm not sure if the Oblast is still in Russia, but it's it's it was in the Soviet Union. Yeah, you know, and it's it, it's symbolic to go there. Like, yeah. let it stop. Stop making. Stop looking at North America when this belongs to the indigenous. Let's go. Like, what is the uh, Yiddish word for diaspora? It's not the Hebrew word for diaspora. And by the way, the Hebrew word for diaspora is not the same as exile. And it's the same in Yiddish. Uh, in Yiddish, it's gulas. In Hebrew, it's gulas. That's exile. That's not diaspora. I don't remember how to say the Hebrew word for diaspora, but it's different. But in Yiddish, it's Ruslan. It's Ruslan because there's different ways to say Russia. But Ruslan cannot just mean Russia. It can mean diaspora. But that means not just Russia. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah Rus is uh, Russia if you just want yeah. to say Russia only. R Rusland. Yeah, my parents always use that expression. Yeah. But... Um... You know, Bundism, you know, I think is appreciated by uh, other uh, social uh, uh, movements as well. Like, uh, what is the Panther Code? Uh, and uh, you seem to have, you know, a unique knowledge, you know, of its origins. You know, perhaps you can give us an elaboration of that as well. That's scary because, like, I'm not the only one that knows about them. A lot of people know about them. It's just that I made the mistake of speaking about it. And I was only forced to do that when I was forced to talk about the massacre of May 27th, it forced people to ask questions that I still don't want people asking. But I mean, I am somewhat able to answer. I just can't speak too much of it, but I, I know that basically, okay, there is, um, I, I'm not sure exactly when, but I know from the original Black Liberation Army and one other guy that was from some other pan, some other uh, chapter of the Black Panther Party, uh, probably Fred Hampton's chapter, maybe I'm mistaken. I, I actually can't remember these things off the top of my head. Um, and I don't always have time to study the blogs that they put out. Um, but um, from the Black Liberation Army and from somebody I believe, I believe that was from, from Fred Hampton's own Black Panther Chicago chapter, um, something called the Black Liberation Organization was formed in response to the Patriot Act. Hmm. And um, these were Black Panthers, obviously, and they were and then in the 2010s, Panther Code was started. Um, because, you know, and so like people ask about Occupy Wall Street. Yeah, it was mostly a labor aristocrat, you know, upset that they are not as wealthy as they were before. But also within there was a lot of black Antifa uh, anarchist um, uh, post unionists that, you know, are thinking about new directions of federated cooperatives like involved in that. And like that continues up to um to Ferguson, the events of the shootings over there, you know, like there's been a there's been a slow buildup, you know, in the 2010s. Panther Code was definitely part of that, but Panther Code, it, it's not that they were clandestine or open. You either knew about them or you didn't, and they're upset that they're known because their their affiliation with uh, the Buddhist movement uh, when they were working with the the five council members. So, but at the same time. The fact that they're being mentioned, they've been defending certain people's reputations, including Jason Unruh, who was being a friend to street cadres. And the problem at the, you know, and there, there's just a lot of things like the world, the first world itself is very degenerate. The culture around Westernism, this is one of the reasons why I have such a beef with secularism. That is secular culture for you. It's, it's very different to what matters. It's never said that um, well, Judaism must survive or Islam must survive. Um, they, they, they vaguely act as if Christianity is on the threat, except they don't actually protect actual uh, endangered Christians to begin with. But this is a big part of Americanism. And the People's Social Freedom Movement is about confronting Zionism, Americanism, but ultimately New Zealand, uh, Australia, and Canada, even, as settler colonial countries that should cease to exist. And you know, we should defer to the natives to decide who stays and who goes. And if who, who stays, you can apply for citizenship. And the beauty of it is most of these natives already recognize the idea of a refugee culture. You know. Um, what we should uh, try to begin doing here, uh, I think, uh, is uh, defining you know, what uh, we mean by, uh, by Judaism uh. and Jewishness. And, uh, you know, the most important sort of uh, aspect of that in terms of the political significance is, you know, what is meant by the Mashiach or the Messiah or the prophet tradition, prophetic tradition in Judaism and how it is, uh, encapsulates a revolutionary uh, popular uh, tradition as well, especially 
I would mention in terms of uh, Samuel, his first book and uh, sixth chapter. Yeah, Samuel. Uh, eighth, eighth chapter, six to 20, yeah, in which yeah, he, he actually presents, you know, a socialist program. It's incredible. Yeah, he, he, uni- he, uh, he, I believe he was the one that anointed Saul and then later he anointed Dan- uh, David. Yeah, all of them, you know, like he even Not Solomon, though, he says nice Saul, you know, because, because, you know, they, the Israelites wanted to be a nation like other nations, you know, and they got so fed up with them, you know, that he chose Saul, who was just, you know, like a, a you know, son of a working class family, you know, just to sort of, you know, spite them because they wanted to be, you know, have a rich king, you know, presiding over them for the prestige and all that sort of thing. So he did the opposite. But anyway, yeah, it's a very interesting. But how would you, you know, get into the definition or the, description of what it is what the term means you know what it means you know me talking about you know messiah and all that sort of thing and how it differs you know from christianity well funny enough uh since we were on panthers um, i genuinely do believe that fred hampton was a messiah but he was not a uh how to explain this he was not a uh oh um a full messiah there's two kinds of messiahs in the gentile terms and there's many types in the jewish terms but there's also this Bundist theory that I developed that I managed to make sure was not offensive to rabbis. That's, that's, that, that, that was, uh, and the way I did that was by not raiding on the parade or denying their, their theologies. Um, but this also means not being able to deny the Samaritan theology, which was part of the idea behind it, because I would argue that they have Jewishness. It, it's disputable whether they're Jewish, because most of them would not take that term. However, one of the things that I learned in tradition is that the term Yehudi predates the word Yehuda. So Yehudi, which is both Arabic and Hebrew for Jewish, that predates the word Judah. That's not very well known. Hmm. And one can make the argument that Isaac was actually the first person Jewish. My, um, like like uh, Rabbi Yehuda Moshe of the Jewish West Africans, he would say that, no, Abraham was Jewish. I would say, no, it starts with Isaac. In fact, Proto-Islam comes, I would say, comes does come from Ishmael, and proto-Christianity does come from Esau. You know, we are a family. I mean, it makes sense because what was cool about the Muslims, they kept Christians and Jews from going at it with each other because we naturally don't like each other. It's not that we're enemies. Christianity became an enemy because of the Western, because of the Romans. The Romans were not the same as the Greeks. Mm. And that's, that, think about this. It's not just Christianity. That's how they were with the Greek gods. The Greek gods were bad enough as they were, but the Romans made it so much worse you know like you know if you think about it alexander didn't really have a problem with jewish people he was just egotistical enough to think he ruled the world you know he really thought he was going to help the world mm-hmm. you know um we wouldn't agree with that but you know the funny thing is, is he was amused by us but it degenerated and that this gets into the thing with western christians have a hard time hearing that in the united states We pushed Happy Holidays because the term Happy Holidays, because Christmas is basically uh, King Antiochus, you know, Uh, you know, Christmas itself, like even the Santa Claus in it, it's not just the, 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 the manger with Jesus, but even Santa Claus, all of that is so commercial that it's exactly what the Maccabees fought against. You know, the Zionists make it sound like that the Maccabees should be in line with, uh, Bar Kukba, which God forbid. And they also do the same thing with the partisans. I agree with putting the partisans next to the Maccabees, but not Bar Kukba. Like, mm-hmm. and so if we get into it, the resistance of simul- assimilation is what Hanukkah is. Now that's not even a high holiday. And yet the Talmud says that uh, when we reach paradise, all the holidays will disappear except for Hanukkah, which is the one that was, you know, it was canon and holiday, but it was the one that's not a high holiday. Well, why is that? I think it's because of what it is. It's it's, it's kind of prophetic that Christianity would turn out the way it was and how, as we developed, Hanukkah became a thing. Mm. Um, but I, 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 it looks like we're, good, we're running low, but I would like to go further into the Messiah and how that connects to a third temple. Okay, go. Cool. Okay. Um, so the, um, there's many concepts of, of, of Messiah, like I said before. Uh, the most famous is the King David one, but if you look into it, there's the concept of the Messiah from uh, the, the tribe from the line of Joseph. There, you know, this was something that was uh, talked about. Like a lot of Samaritans believe this, and in fact, I believe Saul was um, of a different tribe than than, uh, than Judah. I think, in fact, he was a Benjamin. I'm not sure, um, but 
you get into also the idea of a priestly messiah from the from the house of Aaron. That was another thing. So there's three concepts of messiah right there as a person. And mind you, all of them would agree that this takes place in an age. You know, and I think if this is the case, I, I don't care if any of those things happen. I care about the idea of reconciling peace in the city of peace. Because to me, that's if, if, if it's about David, then it's about Jerusalem. And for Jerusalem to be the city of peace, the four quarters have to be at peace with each other. And that has to mean that getting rid of the state of Israel, getting rid of the market inside the four quarters, not necessarily all trade because people would come for holy oils and stuff like that. And there would have to be some exchange. And, and also the people, you know, you've seen this before, the people selling uh, cups of water for a little coins, that should stay too, because that's always been there. You know, like that, that's the beauty of the place is, is if you cleansed out all of the market and you kept all the religious schools and centers in there and you had just a little bit of trade, that would be the third temple. Okay, so you're associating the third temple with a period of peace, you know, which corresponds to, you know, my conception. In fact, I don't, I don't think in terms of a, a messiah, but in terms of messianic age in which once, you know, there is a uh, international peace achieved, you know, by necessary sort of adoption of the principles which are in Mosaic law, and the and then, you know, then you have a messianic age, you know, and then, you know, uh, some religious, you know, consider that at that, that point, you know, the Messiah, is, you know, makes an appearance, you know, or plays, you know, the a role in the, in the achievement of such an age. But I think that it's the age itself that is the important thing. So I don't think that we have much more time than this. So uh, uh, let's us uh, conclude, you know, by saying that uh, we say all the time, you know, which means never again in Yiddish. And in Yiddish, you know, uh, we can say also, I have a phrase that is, you know, which means let us live together, you know, together in the, in the reciprocity, uh, um, wisdom. Seichel is sort of can be translated as wisdom and, uh, and peace. Seichel is a very interesting Yiddish word. You know, there's some words in Yiddish that don't exist in any other language, I think. Well, Seichel is one of them. Well, I, 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 have, a, I have a Ladino word for people. Um, uh, it means Jewish quarter, and that's often, I even apply this to the Jewish quarter of, inside Jerusalem, Judaria. Um, there's actually, an, uh, I encourage people to look up a song called uh, Avraham Avinu, or it's also known as Quandro El Rey Nimrod. Uh, mm -hmm. Look that up. Okay, so good to hear from you again. This is part three of our series on uh, Bundism from the Bundes. Okay, and then I think that we'll have a part four probably. Probably. Yeah. <laughs>